I'm Fernando Mastrangelo, and this is The Path, an interview series that uncovers the business of being an artist. People don't like to think of art as a business, and you know what? I get it. It kind of kills the romance of it, but that's not really realistic anymore. We're trying to grow. We're asking new sets of questions. We're using social media to expand our audience and even get new clients. So we're going to uncover some of the mysteries and strategies behind some of the most successful people in the field today. I want to share those with you so you can really see what it takes to build a successful studio. I'm super excited about this week's episode because I'm sitting with Laura Appleton, who's not only the founder of Kinder Modern, but one of the most dynamic business owners I've met in the design industry. As if owning the gallery wasn't enough, she's also an entrepreneur. She runs the Female Design Council, is working on book projects, also while being a full-time mom. She's a total superwoman. I'm super proud to have her on the show. So let's dive in right now. So we're here with uh, Laura Appleton of Kinder Modern. Uh, we met a few years ago, 2015 actually, at Collective Design Fair, and we've maintained a pretty awesome relationship since. And I wanted to sit down with her today because she's not only owns a design firm, has this company, she's doing a lot of outside things that I find very interesting that I think uh, could provide a lot of value for you guys. So let's jump into it. Awesome. Hi. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for doing this. Thanks um, for coming to Kinder today. So yeah, we met in 2015 at Collective. You were across from us. This was our first, we were rookies to the to the game of, of design fairs. Yeah. And I just remember meeting you and feeling like you were such a powerhouse immediately. Oh, you know, I you had that. this incredible booth, super colorful, bold. You knew about, you knew a lot about business. I was kind of like just getting into this thing and you had a lot of advice for me. You were like, da, 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 da. Unsolicited, I'm sure. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? <laughs> <laughs> but it was but it was great. It's um, I'll never forget that our first meeting in a lot of ways. So awesome, me too. Now that it's been maybe four or five years since then, uh, I kind of wanted to talk to you about art fairs, design fairs. You've done an extensive amount of these. You know them in and out, and I feel like a lot of people who are starting companies mm -hmm. are asking these questions. In fact, just yesterday we were talking to a young designer who was who's been invited to do a fair. And she didn't really have a strategy just yet. So we started to sort of talk about that because you really got to know what, what you're doing when you're about to pay 20, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 dollars sometimes no or joke. above. It's no joke. Travel, this and that. You got to have a strategy. So little, tell me a little bit about your experiences with them, maybe some of the, the better things that come out of it and some of the things to, 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 to know about the industry of fairs because it's literally an industry. I this is actually a perfect conversation and question for me because I launched Kinder Modern the Gallery at the inaugural Collective Design Fair. So I chose to launch my gallery at a show where we had a little more flexibility and instead of doing a pop-up or launching in a full gallery and not having the audience. So I was really excited about that in the beginning. And each year we worked really hard to try and bring a different show uh, Kinder Modern is a design gallery that started focusing purely on historical and contemporary child design. Our inventory is from about 1890 to 1990, which is a large uh, span. So we were introducing all of this to the general public, to the design community, even to the fair um, owners and uh, other veteran galleries. Yeah, there wasn't, there's, no, there's no one else really in this sort of niche market. Correct? I mean, there are some other galleries that may have a few pieces or even a section of kids, but other than that, um, Kinder Modern is the only gallery focusing on this genre. And how did you decide to collect this? I mean, okay, number one, they're expensive. How did some you decide to? How did you decide to go ahead and say, "Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and launch my company uh, doing this"? Did you also have PR backing you at the same time? Did no, you? No. Not in the beginning. Um, we actually were turned on to Collective by a PR company that we met with, okay. <laughs> um, who we didn't actually end up signing with. We couldn't afford it in the beginning, and it was just a real fortuitous conversation that happened, and it was just so lucky, because I didn't really know much about the design landscape at that point, sure. and I was... I'm big on letting the creative move the decisions, taking the risk. I don't think too much about risk till after I've jumped in the pool. <laughs> um, it seems to be sort of counterintuitive to creativity. 
You know, you I just agree. have to put yourself out there. You have to do what you're trying to do, say what you're trying to say. And that takes time to shape. Like when we launched, we knew we were highlighting this niche that was super interesting. We had about 98% vintage on the first show with a little bit of contemporary moving that nod towards where we were headed. And the year we met in 2015, we did a full 100% contemporary show. Right. And for me, that was really exciting because I was chartering this landscape that hadn't really been touched of thinking about gallery level work for the children and the smaller sure. people in our lives. Was it, uh, was it success? Year one, 2014, I believe, right? That would have been year 2013 one. 2013 was year, year one. one. So that it must have been successful. We kept coming back, yes. Um, so you I made think, your money back. You were saying, okay, like this was a worthwhile. I don't think it was financially successful oh, for us, it? just to be okay. honest. Okay. No, I think the first year we got a little help and support. Uh, so it wasn't solely on us financially. The second year was really expensive and killed me. Okay. I've discovered that selling furniture on the floor at a design fair for kids doesn't really work so well. Okay. That this was always fair work for us was marketing, just concentrated marketing. It was better than an ad because you have thousands of people that you get your work in front of. That's right. It was also an opportunity for us to put an exhibition up that is our point of view. Right. This is who I am and what I have to say, right? And so we took that to full force. So you weren't even really thinking, you were like, listen, if it's financially viable or not, it's irrelevant because this is part of our marketing strategy to a certain degree. In hindsight, yes, that sounds great. The bottom oh. line is <laughs> so um, that was... we were starving and we needed to make cash and it wasn't sure. happening and either we were gluttons. But I want to just say, it. like, we've had a similar experience. I want people to understand, like, we do the fair, we don't sell off the floor. We don't sell at the fair. That is not really what happens. You brand build, mm -hmm. and then emails hopefully start to come through. You do follow up. And the year up. after is where you find what you That's right, where you start really to done. like. Right. I, find, I had found that that was more accurate in the more trade show oriented. When you're dealing with ICFF, which I launched you my uh, modular carpet at, um, AD Home, same thing. When it's a little more trade focused and sure. not uh, design exhibition focused, Yes, I think you can definitely afford to make, like you can, what, what am I trying to say here? Basically like it, the year is okay because you put in this work and you know over time you're gonna form those it's relationships form. Gotcha. with the buyer. So you're really going there for relationships. I think- So when, let's distinguish a little bit because this is kind of interesting. You talk about it really fast, like ICF, the AD home. All of those have very different markets, target markets, yes. right? So Different understand- people come to each show. That's right. Trades people, design lovers, collectors. I think each one has its own little pocket of interested parties. And you would take different kind of content to each one, right? Yes. So at the collective, obviously, you're going with your most expensive, most unique, contemporary- Expense or... never drives anything for okay. me. So I wasn't curating or collaborating on works to make expensive pieces. I was making incredible pieces that just happened to cost a lot to make. <laughs> um, I think, well, there's a distinction, right? Sure. Like I'm really about, you know, paying good money for great product, great product, right? I'm not about ripping people off because they can afford it. And I'm not implying that you are or no. anyone else is for that matter. But for us, it's really about the work. Sure. And so I wanted to work with a ton of different designers globally to give a little bit of a unique perspective on what materials they were working in, what their point of view, and how that was brought to the world of children's furniture, which is quite unique um, for people to turn their attention on that. After Collective, we, we really shook it up a little bit. We moved, mm -hmm. we tried trade. Uh, I we saw took you everywhere. Design to an art I'm show. Hamptons. I feel like you did, you did or I don't know. I feel like you've just we done. The Hamptons. We, we did Pulse Miami, Pulse. which was an incredible show. It was a little That's art, wacky. Though. That's art. It was a full on art fair during Basel. How did you get yourself into an art fair as a design company? Or just, or, or oh, I didn't gallery? really think about it. I was like, we're awesome. Get us in. What are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, like, I think, you know, we had <laughs> okay. great. We had great. <laughs> no, work. no. I, listen, I love it, but they're, they're, it's not just like that. You no, have, no, no, you no, no, no. It's not just like, like that at all. Right. Let, me, let me back up a little yeah. bit. So, sorry about that. I think we first did Pulse New York, and I was working with uh, one of my original designers and artists, Lucas Mawson, mm. and he had started a project uh, with his girlfriend, Marguerite Cranes, who was an artist. Mm -hmm. And when they first started courting one another, they were texting pictures of chairs making love. 
uh, which turned into a project called the Chair Affair. And they <laughs> photographed uh, sculptural connections of historic chairs and new chairs in, un, in compromising positions. <laughs> and I thought it was such an incredible photo series because we often are not thinking about, do chairs emit anything? Is yeah. there energetic components to the pieces that we put around us? So there was like a relationship there. There were dynamics of, is it, you know, are these couples male, female? Are they gay? Are, what is the interaction of them? And so I was really interested in the context so I put together a show that would highlight the photographs, mm. but also would highlight some sculpture. And then there was a text that was written that we hired actors to read those texts that were from the point of view of the actual inanimate objects. So we made it this event, you know, twice yeah. a day, we had readings by these incredible actors and they would read about, oh, I see your nice legs over there, wink, wink. You know, so there was this real tongue in cheek <laughs> way People were like, what is this? Yeah. You're a child design company at Pulse and your chairs are fucking? Like, I don't get it. Exactly. So there was like a real, that's when I knew, oh, maybe you're not doing what other people are doing. Like, I thought this was all normal. You know, I was just. And by normal, you mean like taking the context of what that fair is about, creating an exhibition that is not only engaging about the stuff that you are interested in, but realizing that in this fair context, uh, an art fair context, you have to have, there's gotta be some meaning, there has to be a story, a narrative, Absolutely. is that what you mean? Well, to me, all Like you wouldn't take that to ICFF. Context. Pardon? You wouldn't take a show like that to ICFF. Not in the same way, no. I mean, I think then it's more experiential marketing because you're in a corporate stance, sure. right? I think art and experiential marketing are very different things. So to be clear, the choices that we made for Pulse and for that particular show were about how do we bring the viewer in? How do I engage sure. different levels of audience? A lot of people in the design space at first were not that interested that it was super chic kids furniture. Either they didn't have kids, don't want them, or anything like that. So there was, I was like, how do I engage those people? Yeah. And then there was an older generation who had this incredible nostalgia. The younger generation who loved because they were attracted by the shapes and the forms and the materials and all these different things. So I started recognizing early on that you're never speaking to one person with the work that you do in the world. And so each of these fairs and thus the audience that goes, really, we need to engage them in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so I just didn't see a lot of barriers to doing so. I wanted to just create really fun, engaging works where people could learn about what I do and learn about design for children and learn about design in a different way. And how are you getting that, this information? The, 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 are you, because you say, oh, I got to, you know, people, how are you engaging your audience to understand what their experiences is? Like, uh, you, you end a fair and then do you sit back and you sort of dissect what went on? How do you... How do you get that? I'm on the floor. That's number one. As you are. owner, yeah, I'm You're the chief face, bottle right. washer. I'm ahead, sure. you know, on the floor doing sales. I'm interacting with people. I want to hear if I've got to turn the crowd. You know, if someone's in there with, oh, this is a kid, you're like, oh, okay, let's talk about it till you see that it is. Or, sure. or let's understand what I didn't do where I wasn't able to engage you. Like, I'm constantly thinking, how do I get this incredible message of mm -hmm. living with children is beautiful and these you can live with nice things? Like there's a lot sure. of themes that we I'm trying to dispel essentially about um, kids being uncool. I think it's actually quite amazing to grow up with different ages around you. You know, generationally we've shifted a bit, and so I'm thinking a lot about that uh, in designing pieces, in living in different spaces, and trying to make cool stuff for people to live with their kids. To piggyback on this, since, uh, since we're on it, how are you engaging, the you're now designing your own pieces? Uh, obviously you've established that you're working with other artists, you work in vintage, but how did this start and kind of why? Because now you have several business models going on. We do, it's a little confusing at times, sure. but so, I feel like in this economy and in this market mm -hmm. where everything is so fast, you have to really move as quick as the world does. Right. I always wanted to have our in-house design studio so that we could start to work on our own works but not reinvent the wheel. I don't wanna put work out that's already happening. 
So we spent about a year just ideating and like really digging into form and function and developmental needs and. But was it also based on a, a gap in the market that you saw or? Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, okay. no one had really hit, there was either luxury baby. Luxury baby, okay. Or high end sort of custom kid. Okay. And then there was a lot of inexpensive, AKA cheap, small brands or even large big box brands right. who were doing kids stuff where it was all felt disposable. It went against right, the I curve from a sustainable standpoint, from, you know, you knew you, when you bought the piece that in two years you were going to toss sure. it. Toss and it. that felt horribly like, a, just not what I wanted to be a part sure. of. So we also felt like, you know, the rug thing I fell into, to be honest. Um, I invented this modular carpet series and it was really about, I was on the floor with my kid all the time and I needed to have beautiful, softer pieces that we weren't getting torn up from, from crawling around. And I also didn't understand why rugs couldn't be not rectilinear. Like that right. was really, I don't, I was like, I don't understand. Sorry, like why right. does everything have to, like I felt so constricted and I didn't want to just go to an oval or a circle. So the first piece that we did were trapezoids and hexagons and you know, that was right. in 2014 and prime example, I, mean, I did ICFF, we killed it, you know, like killed it in terms of reception. That was with, um, we with did the, that with the, just the just carpet. This, yeah. Which yeah, was called the Kinderground. The green, the green boot. No. So that was 80 home. Oh, okay. No, my first home, carpet right. line was two years before that. Okay. And a lot of people in the industry who've come up since didn't necessarily know, but they, we had a huge effect on the market at that point. Interesting. We didn't sell for shit on the floor. It took us a year to make back that money in terms of sales and turnover Investment, and everything right. else. Um, and we won awards and we looked great. And so I think one of the biggest takeaways from all of that is you can't just boil it down to a, a financial bottom line in the design business. You know, I think a lot of people like to make a distinction between art and design. Yeah. But I think that the, the concepts behind the work are very similar and you can't always put it into a marketing box or put it into, you know, click response. You know, if, if you have to, people feel, especially with your work, they feel emotionally connected to the piece. Mm -hmm. They want to give you money to get that piece because they want to own it. And I, I think that, that relationship uh, is interesting. I'm a collector. I built my business around collecting and sharing those works and thinking about where they came from, who made them, why they made them, what they're made out of, why they've lasted so long. Yeah, you see, this is what I'm really, you know, I guess I've, I've known this about you. The, the way that you're engaged is like full spectrum. You're, you have a very macro and micro way of looking at the world or Thank in you. terms of the, yeah, in terms of design, you know what I mean? Because it, it's rare that someone is this engaged in the minutia of their, of their businesses. You know what I mean? This is what I find most particular about your personality, the way you approach things. It's like, you're really looking. And I just, I want to emphasize that only because like, that's the level of, 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 deep thought and thinking about your business that you need to be doing to, to, to have it move forward. Even if you're saying like, okay, the rugs at first didn't, you know, it wasn't about, uh, you know, making a return on that right away. So looking at sort of the, the long-term effect that these things will have and being able to pull yourself out there and say, okay, like this may return in two years, but. I think there's a fantasy that everything returns quickly. I know. I mean, that's what hard it's like. work over and over and dedication, that's what returns. Totally. And I think that social media has definitely shifted that visual paradigm to make us believe that what looks good is good. Sure. But no, that just looks good. And, and to be honest, it's a blessing and a curse. So because of my strong band branding background and because I'm very um, dedicated to how things look around here, we make sure we look good in everything that we put out it's a little deceptive because what's going on behind the scenes isn't always as gorgeous as what's it's looking out in front. And I'm very quick to share that because I think that's a well, common... Another, I mean, you put your best foot forward, obviously, you always. want to show, but you know, in turn, that it, like, listen, there's a grind behind all of this. Huge and, grind. Right. And it's not always turning into a success right away, but although it's, you know, you're presenting your best foot 
forward. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It also depends on what your goals are, right? Like Kinder Modern was never, we're going to create a product and sell said product. You mentioned sure. the multitude of business models. Because of that, we're constantly putting our energy, our, our funds into growth. And so we're five years old. It's not that long. And we've done an extraordinary amount. I think we've had over 17 different shows of design fairs and exhibitions and various things that I'm exceptionally proud of. Um, I don't think I intended to do that much, but we just kept getting asked and it was hard to say no. And we weren't doing any other type of marketing initiative. So to me, I could justify the spends and the effort. So now what? So you've, you're changing your strategy now. Always. So you just brought up social media. You started strong on social media. I mean, you were pushing hard on that, obviously, as you <laughs> launched the business. That's changing. You're not doing fairs. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Where are you? you're you're obviously the the company the company's growing. <laughs> you're making more. So where is that? Where are you putting that? Where where where's that going? I think mm -hmm. our energies have shifted from specifically from the showing model because I feel like it's a setup. It's not really structured for the designers. You know, I don't blame people who put on fairs and exhibitions because it costs a lot to do, especially when you're sure. doing big city in New York City or what have you, which is primarily where we've shown. And we've shown outside of the largest tier. So it costs to do business. The pay to play model though is really difficult for creative industry. Where yeah. are we getting those funds? We're not selling enough. We're made, you know, especially for us, we're a few of a kind pieces. Uh, we're made to order on the contemporary yeah. side. We don't stock a ton of inventory because not so much on the expenses on the space. Where is it going? Sure. We're in Manhattan. So I think all of those decisions have worked into us choosing creative and innovative ways to do business. We're doing a lot more shows in our space and leveraging what we do have. And that's always tough for me because I love my space and I, I love where we work, but I always want bigger and uh, more functional so that we can do different types of work. Meaning how you would expand like to have a shop in-house where you could actually We definitely prototype need a prototype. We are doing a good amount of prototyping, but um, we just mess the place up all the time and we're scattered all over and we do what we have to do. But yes, having that would be game changing for us. Um, but at the same time, we're also just using that as an example. You know, Kinder Modern as the design firm where we're putting out our own products um, if anyone's watching that release, it's very slow. Mm -hmm. It's piece by piece because we can't afford to do full giant collections. And so I'd rather put all my energy and love and sweat and tears into making a piece exceptional That's than it. worrying about a full collection because I need to fill some void or have that many pieces. I think there's all these ideas of setups of like what you're supposed to do. Yep. I I'm not into any of it. I yep. feel like it's a try and buy situation and you have to shake it up and so see you're willing what works. to pivot on, a, on something that you're that, on a dime on a always dime. yeah right but i'm not the norm i think i don't have a ton you, of fear with you, that kind of stuff you're not the norm right but that's what this is why this place stays dynamic i believe you're okay oh, you know what i mean because you're willing to say okay ch 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 try different strategies i mean you go hard 17 shows I can't even, I, I, it's hard to wrap my brain around that in five years. That's just a lot of exhibitions. It was too much, it but too it much. got us on the map. That's what I was going to say. It, defi it definitely helped get it your- It definitely helped. Right, and um, your sales started to increase year by year. You told me- And I, yeah, level. sales are increasing. I also made a lot of mistakes. I'll be candid. I, because of all this pivoting, mm -hmm. which sounds like sexy from afar, <laughs> um, we would do a different type of show. Like when our first uh, AD home show, we did full kids and some of our carpet and it was great and it was under Kinder Modern. For the second show, when I did the collaboration with Ceramicist with Cody Hoyt, Cody Hoyt. Uh, one of the ones that we're guys. sitting on right yeah. now, which I, to date, it's one of my favorite uh, collaborations that I've worked on. We did an AD home show and we really pushed our design studio, kind of our pet name for, you know, our in-house name of mm -hmm. Studio Kinder as well as had a very bold display of all these, you know, incredibly bold graphic rugs. And we launched our first line, our heritage collection for the Kinder Modern line. And as you can tell right now, see all the names, it messed us up. Clients were like, you were at the show? I was like, at the show? I killed it at the show. <laughs> it was beautiful. Like, what do you mean? How could you? So oh, what do you think? Wait, that, what, what, what the was... rugs, like so many. Or we'd have people walk into the booth and be like, this isn't kids. And you're like, okay. I got you. It's not kids. Sure. It's for 
kid for me, you know? And I think, so a lot of those little I mistakes see. made me see, sometimes you do, you don't have to stay in your lane, but you have to be cautious how much you throw at the world, right? Yeah, and I'm, I've saying. had a little hard time with that. You know, I think we go through the same things at the studio quite a bit. I mean, I move and pivot quite a bit and things change on a dime. And, but I think that not everyone's paying as close attention to what we're doing sometimes. That's why I just think, okay, cool. Like that you can, can get away with it. Yeah, yeah, we can be more nimble that way, but you're right. It starts to cascade. You have a lot going on and you think, well, you know, this is becoming unclear to, to my audience. Yeah. Um, we did one other pivot this past year, yeah. which is a huge so, one in January, ooh. which I'm really excited about. Um, we opened up to full collections. So we're not just uh, representing or selling child design. We now have full adult collections. That's what I was going to, modern, right? Um, is it, yes. I remember no, one point no you vintage. said to me, you said, no, no, you, call, you were calling it just modern. Or is that, we we were doing all kinds of stuff again. Okay. No, but that's why I just I remember it that back. from one of our last conversations. It actually was called grown up. <laughs> grown up. Yeah, okay. and I I dialed that back because I, I thought you know what I've spent five years and we just had our anniversary and it felt so good building the brand of Kinder Modern. Why am I going to put that under something mm, else? Like mm -hmm. I'm not afraid mm -hmm. of caring. If I want to sell Lay's potato chips under Kinder Modern, you could be sure I'm going to sell Lay's potato chips. And I just don't feel like I had to answer too much of that. That said, there are artists and designers who've turned me down because they're afraid of being represented by a child design gallery. And I'm like, no problem. We are not meant to work together because if you don't see the vision of what's happening here and what I'm capable of and what I can do for your work, it's probably not the right relationship right. anyway. And we're going slow. So you are you are looking at designers to, to well we are we have a lot of conversations. Okay. I mean we have a number of grown up collections that we represent now. Uh, we have <laughs> grown up collections. You call it grown up collections. We do because sometimes you know when you look at our work online, we've had some issues with scale because they're such gorgeous um, designs and forms. Sure. They evoke an older type, and so you don't always know if you don't have a little coat can next sure. to it, like what the real scale is, what the age group. And I've just sort of gotten into this space, most when we were designing our own work, of finding this little funny spot between kid and grown up, mm -hmm. where we can all share the same pieces and live in different ways. Like kids just aren't using furniture the way they used to or the way that we do. And so it sort of all relates back to, it's all under the kinder umbrella. Okay. And then we also started designing space, which has been really exciting for us. It's been a difficult shift for our team how how are you sh how are you getting those gigs? I mean, are you putting yourself out there? No, the way that, no, no, not no. yet. No, because okay. be, I haven't seen you know. No, no, no. We I mean we've done a few smaller projects. Okay. Um, we did a Dumbo project um, where we're doing residential amenities spaces, playrooms, okay. um, family space within high rise buildings in Manhattan and Miami. So. And that is you sort of telling clients just on the on privately that, hey, this is something that we offer now. This is something that I'd be We're not telling very many because no. we, to be honest, we had to shift our entire way of doing business. And we're when? not interior designers and we wanted to create a design studio that didn't have to rely on interior design skills, but thought more about the functionality of the space. And so you'll see some stuff coming up in the next year or so where we're partnering with pretty awesome interior designers so that we can do what we do and they can do what they do. And we can bring all of that to really great development projects. I'd love to see a whiteboard of your, of, of, of how all of this lays out for you, you know, because oftentimes- That's how that's, I feel about you though, so. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, right. That's why I feel like we share a similar dynamic in that sense, because I know you have a grand vision of things and you're basically slowly, you know, adding to it, adding to it, adding to it, sort of like you're building this monstrosity. It seems like, you know what I mean? And that has tentacles everywhere. It's, the tentacles are a bit unintentional. I think for me, it's really, I'm trying to get a little more balance in the day-to-day -day work. I don't always have to, wanna have to be on this hustle to make rent, hustle to do, you know, find ways to eke out to do that creative vanity sure. project or what have you. Mm -hmm. And so the first part of our 2019 goals, if that'll help, sure. is, really doubling down on our existing clients, on the work cool. that we do, on bringing the work that we've done to larger bodies of humans, if Audience. you will, to public. Um, How do you do that? Not through social media. Well, 
social media, I toned down a little bit. I think. Um, yeah, I'd love to talk about that a little bit. Just the political system in the U.S. right now uh, and in the world, but clearly here is really temperamental and really complicated. And so for me personally, I don't feel great posting, hi, here's my pretty chair, come buy it, when mm -hmm. my human rights are at stake. And that was something that, just personal. I run sure. our Insta. I, I'm very cautious about that. I don't have anyone feed How do you it. reach a new audience then? How do you reach, you know, if you're doubling down on your current uh, clients and then trying to... Posts are still happening, don't worry. Okay. Um, but I think it's just a little more... It's a little more human. It's a little more about what I'm going through and what I'm thinking about and what's affecting the filter in my head of how I'm putting work out, right? So this here, mm -hmm. this is the filter in everything that I'm learning about and everything that I'm learning through doing. And so there's like this front and back that happens and I want that filter to be cast on my day to day. I wanna live a happier, more joyous, more connected life. Mm -hmm. And I don't think social media is the path to that. I think that's an evil that has to exist. But at the same time, I've connected to some incredible people um, in the world through social media. And I've gotten clients, design collaborations. I feel like it's given me this instant access. Sure. Like if I see someone, I'm like, that person's amazing. I love what they're doing. I want to talk to them. You I don't even them. think, and I'm right in there. And they always respond. It's amazing. I'm like, OK. so. You must like what I'm doing or you wouldn't respond or so maybe you're just bold enough to put yourself out there and it worked for me, you know, because I think that's really. I mean, you challenging. are starting to have you have this sort of, you know, you have the business, but you're also a figure, you know, you're having like a, you're a figure in the design world. You know what I mean? Thank so you. you have a personal brand, I feel like, which ties into the female design council, which we can talk about, too, which I'd love to talk about and really especially because of our where we're at right now about you know, it's very timely. It's very timely. Yeah. And you're very passionate about this. And so I was wondering if this was part of your strategy in terms of your personal brand. Like to to have a voice so as a, a female in this industry uh, to also help your business. If that's not what it is, then, you know. That's not where it started. Okay. Um, I, the Female Design Council literally, I'll give you the short version story. We were launching this space that we're in mm -hmm. right now. We were in a smaller space, and this was a big deal for us. This was a huge jump. This move into this here. This move into yeah. here. And to having <clears throat> a proper showroom where our clients could come and see yeah. the work was crucial and space for us to do our work. Yeah. And our opening was the night after the election. Right. And we had more RSVPs than we've ever had in our life. Like, I felt like, this is it. You yeah, know, like finally people are going to come. It's going to be great. It just felt really great. And then when I woke up in the morning, I thought, right. what should I do? Should I cancel? Do I? And I was like, hell no, I'm not canceling. But I'm also not placing expectation on anyone. And so right. I wrote a letter, like a personal letter to our mailing list, which I've never done. And it was something I, I just felt like I had to say, I'm hurting. I know you must be too. If you can't hang, I'll hang for you. Like, I just felt really strong in it yeah. all. Like, yeah, this sucked. And yeah, I was heartbroken. And yeah, I had tons of whiskey the night before to work through it. But when I woke up in the morning, I was like, uh-uh. My yeah. staff has worked way too hard. And I also, so when I sent that letter out, I got flooded with response. You did. Yeah. Flooded yeah. by strangers, though. Right. People I've never well, spoken yeah. to. And they just I, saw the human side of your business and, and who you are. Yeah, that, that was probably, you know, it was probably a good thing. But I place. didn't I didn't think about the repercussions. I was really moved by the responses. Yeah. People were like, I wasn't going to get out of bed. And then I got this note and I thought, if you're out of bed, I'm out of bed or whatever. It was That's the awesome. gist. And right. so it was just like an aha moment. I mean, Oprah's spot on with that stuff, I'll tell you. And we <laughs> literally, like, I think we had an open meeting the next month like i had this idea to do to create an organization to support women in general but in design i felt like how can i subside in this country mm -hmm. where the man in the highest power is not respecting my physical body right like how, why do, chairs don't mean anything at that point right and so 
I needed to find a way to move through that mm. frustration and anger so that it didn't take over my life. And right. so I figured if I'm feeling this, I bet a lot of people are too. And so we just hosted a meeting here at Kinder and told a couple of friends we didn't send anything out. I wasn't going to leverage my list or anything like that. And the room was packed with a bunch of ladies that I was like, who are all these people? And we held it again the following month, and it was a completely different set of people. And I was like, oh my god, I think we're onto, onto something. something. Yeah. And the, the conversations for the first, I would say, six months were much more about frustration and thinking, how do we work through this? And it was helping me craft a structure for what this organic thing was going to be. Yeah. And I realized that there's a lot of organizations who support different facets in design, but I wasn't really feeling anyone putting that effort and that spotlight on women doing amazing things in design. And that yeah. I felt like what I was seeing in the press was yep. really skewed from what I was seeing in international design shows and schools. And I was like, this is really varied. Why can't we get those a little more balanced, mm -hmm. you know? And I also knew for myself, we were talking about business models and all these different things. I feel like if you can't see it, you can't build it. So sometimes you just need to see someone who looks similar to you or does something similar so you can go, oh, can they got that, I can do that too. And that took me a long time to realize that that's what I needed. And I wanted to build that for others because nobody gave me a hand. And I wanted to give everyone else as much of a hand as possible. Maybe too much though. How's it evolved since it's been because I, mean, I went to the lecture at the um, at the Brooklyn Museum, and so that was probably my first real interaction with with the, uh, with the council. So I mean, yeah, I got to see. I spent the last year building an incredible board of advisors, our council of women in different roles in design. Um, we focus a lot of our efforts on monthly events of conversations of issues that we're dealing with in design or positive things that are happening. You know, that talk at the Brooklyn Museum was uh, powerful women doing Four amazing power, yeah, things. We had Frances right? Burnett from who's the first female president of Pratt, yeah. um, as well who as- Who I loved. I just thought she was the most elegant so and eloquent great. person. Um, so inspiring. Yeah, so inspiring, yeah. And you don't care that she's a woman when you're listening to her. No. You're just like, she's badass. She's badass and yeah. she's had this incredible arc in the industry. And I thought, wow, I wonder if things would have happened a little quicker for me if I had seen that. Mm -hmm. And so the FTC, our first dibs joined as a bit of a founding partner, if you will. And well, that's made a huge difference because it's given us the ability to gather and make connections and reach, for more, our industry and too. reach more people. Yep. And we're just- And you fortified those that, uh, that part of the relationship. You went to First Dibs and said, listen- uh, I didn't a... go to First Dibs. Actually, one of our board members, uh, Tiana Webb Evans, who's oh. just such an incredible, inspired leader and communication specialist, she brought in Amelia, uh, who's the director of partnerships at First Dibs, and she's also on our board. Awesome. So we've really stacked some incredible- um, Talk a little people. bit about the, the, the business model. I had said, you know, oh, we started in good company as a 501c3 and you right. said, no. we actually, when ex we made it for profit. Yeah. What is, what's the intention there? I would love to hear about that structure. That was the hardest it. part of this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, because at first it was like, oh, kumbaya, we're all meeting. This is great. Sure. We're helping each other. The goals for me were to pass work around contracts, to be able to actually move physical work to people at the same time of highlighting women that are doing great things. So when I started looking into financial structures and I've served on a number of boards, I felt like the 501c3 was obtuse and in my way and not really helpful. And I couldn't wrap my hand around it. And then I couldn't afford the fees just to set up the whole thing. And so I started looking into other, you know, tax, related structures that yeah. would help. And so I looked into the, I think it's called the, the B Corp, the 3CL Corp. These are all sort of tax structures to- um, When you're providing a good- when you're doing Yeah, a good, if you're working yeah. in service in a in business service, structure, yeah. but none of them really do anything. And so I started really thinking about, well, is there, the only benefit to the 501c3 is the tax write-off from the larger corporations. And I didn't want to spend time raising money. raising money. I wanted to spend time supporting women. And it seemed very counterproductive. Plus, this is not my full-time thing. Sure. So I really wanted to figure out a way to 
build a social missive for-profit structure, kind of like Tom's, of, you know, Tom's shoes. Yes. Yep. And so I looked at a number of those models. None of them fit because no one that I have seen has done this in the membership structure way. And so I'm trying to figure out now we're creating ways to monetize different partnerships, uh, different events, uh, mm -hmm. different things for brands to converse and connect with our members from awesome. outside agencies who want to gain access in different ways for, and take that money and put it straight back into the community and put it straight into educational events. And that's through a subscription fee. Yeah, so we have a very low membership fee. I think our lowest membership is like $5 a month for okay. students. And I think our highest is maybe $12 a month. Oh, okay. And it's on purpose. We, again, I am not trying to set up Right. a pay to play method for these ladies. Sure. Like I didn't want that to be the structure. You want it to sustain itself and over time. It's find like administrative a model. fees sure. when all sure. said and done. So I think, I mean, I think a year mem membership, let's say is 150 bucks, like for a year. And it's great because you gain. How do you vet? How do you get people? Involved? So we have not reached out to gain members. Uh, it's all been through word of mouth okay. at this point. We're just starting to think about targeting certain groups of ladies specifically for their background. We think it's really helpful. Architects need our help. You know, they're not always the ones out front talking about the work, but they definitely need some lights shown on mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. work that they are doing. This was lights shown by the way. <laughs> okay. um, and I think, you know, over time, we want to answer the needs of the community. And we've seen so much amazing stuff happen already of collaborations, of you know, women reaching out to get what they need. And that's part of the challenge of being a female businesswoman entrepreneur. We're not always taught to be the ones standing on the building screaming, saying, I'm amazing. You know, it's like not really how it goes. Sure. And so even myself, I find like I have no problem talking about the work that I do and I tend to be pretty outgoing. But then I find myself holding back in funny ways, and I know it's from upbringing, and I know it's from in what in what, in what sense? In what, like, give me an example of holding back, I don't like holding back your opinion. You're saying holding no, back. No, I'm not your, good at that. Yeah, but yeah. I think um, holding, not saying the work that I'm doing, not promoting mm. myself mm. per se. I'm much more about promoting everyone around me, and right. I find you were asking in the beginning, is that part of your brand build? No, but I found it's a skill set that I'm good at is being a connector and making introductions. Yes. And there is cast off and positive cast off from that effort. And so I'm not going to deny, hopefully over time, so this like will a behind help. behind the scenes uh, connector that, event, that basically stays into the, in the conversation because of that. Exactly. So you, right. And That's... not so much about, like, I don't need to be in the conversation. I just like the conversation. I want to do great work with great people. And... Mm -hmm. I a, think you want to be in the conversation. You you like the, you know you like the you you have a strong opinion. You that's true. know how to articulate your opinion, and you have a way of zooming out and seeing the world, right? Seeing the industry and the world, and saying, okay, like this, there's gaps here. This is not right. Mm -hmm. da, 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 and you're trying to sort of fix all of that. You know, it's it's so many different mindsets that you're in. You're you know between just the logistics of running a business. Mm -hmm. And then zooming out as a as a as a woman entrepreneur and saying, okay, like and a mom, and a mom on top of that, which we haven't even talked about. Which yeah. is, I know it comes up in a lot of your interviews. You know, obviously because of the nature of your business as well. You know, mm -hmm. being a mom is also crucial. Um, yeah, actually, when I start to think about all of those things, it's like I can't even understand how how you manage it all. But I do know how you manage it all by you just hustle, you just work, and you. You're passionate about the ideas. Nothing's easy that you want. And you motivate the hell out of people around you. I've always been like that. Yeah. You have this motivational sort of way about you that's like... I'm positive. Exactly. I mean, it's funny because I think a lot of people would say, like, I'm tough, but I am totally positive. I believe that you can do anything. Because I have. You're tough wear as, as a... You well, know, just by having a strong opinion, I think you get known as being a, a tough gal or a bitchy or loud or whatever. And I'm like, bring it on. Label me anything you want. Like, I'm clear with me and I and love... You're, you, you're like, yeah, right. You understand who you are and what you bring to yeah, the Yeah, I mean, do so. I want to do it softer sometimes? Sure. Do I want to not have to yell, hey, over here? Why, sure. You... But I think that's not gender related as much as just okay, life related. Okay, I can related. ask you that. That's just... That, that's Listen, 
I love being a woman and that's part of who I am. I really wish the conversation for women in general was a little bit different, that they focus on the work and not the story. You know, it's a big thing. I was talking with- That they um, focus on the work and not the story. Yeah, so with architects, for instance, I was having this conversation uh, with Hillary from MM, MOS Architects and she runs the housing and architecture program at Columbia. And she's working on this really amazing uh, writer's project where she's having female architects write about the work. Because every time they're, they're interviewed, it's how many children do you have? What does your husband do? I mean, I know that sounds shocking to you, but it's yeah. a commonality in communication. Women are not, we're, we're put in a different um, hierarchy in terms of business structure, family structure, life structure. There's different rules placed on us. Like we might be the breadwinner, but we still got to run back and feed the baby and make sure the sitter's paid before we get to our next meeting. And so it's a funny little balance. How did you, how did you get that? Um, how have you had this level of confidence? Was it something that you- that Fake you, it till you make it. I don't think it's all confidence so much as clarity. You know, I love the work that I do. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. And then there's a portion that I have no idea that I'm discovering along the way, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm over 40, that helps. You know, you get to a point where you're like, I can't care too much about what everybody thinks. Right. And you start really turning back inward and saying, okay, what's important to right. me? And my son, first and foremost, he's the muse. And then after that, my work. And they're still kind of balanced because my work is everything. It's my creativity. It's my soul, my passion. And I'm just scratching the surface of where I'm headed. So I think that's what's more exciting to me um, yeah. is what that manifests to. Damn, I think a lot of people need to spend more time, like, just be around you. If it, you know, people should come intern here and just get a little sense of- Oh, they of, do. They do, uh, yeah. We have a pretty Good. You robust know, I feel intern like... program. You do? Yeah. See, wow. Anytime that I feel like I'm doing a lot, I think I'm just gonna need to come spend a little time exactly with you. That's exactly how I feel with you. But I also think half of this is talking and I'm really mean? clear about that. Um, what do you mean by this is just talking? This so is... I say a lot of things before they're actually happening. I okay. say, oh, I've got this idea. I'm doing this book. Sure. I'm doing this project. I'm working right. on this collaboration. It was an idea. Maybe I talk to someone about it. Maybe I don't but it puts it out there into the right. universe and then it forces me yeah. to have to do it. You have to run yeah. and catch up and get into that place and be like, oh, right, I am doing that, I'm getting You know ready. what, I think I have a similar strategy because it keeps you almost uh, committed to the thing. When, when, when you start to oh, speak yeah, about it, when you put it onto the world- you have to actually stand up. And then you have to actually yeah. go and do it, right? Even just like through this interview series where it's work, you know, it's work, but, but it's also where my passion is. It's also, well, an extension of my passion, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And Getting... You've always been about pulling up the other person. Absolutely. I think that's how we related. Because I remember yep, collective, that spirit. first chat was like, I need a gallery. I'm like, no, you don't. You don't need a gallery. You're a gallery. Well, I was not. No, they wanted me to have a gallery no, I to participate. You. Yes. And I was like. But yeah. I mean, even after that, we talked about representation yeah. and we talked about positioning and yes. who and what. And you, like us, I mean, I've not been represented by anyone because I represent Perfect. people. But if I were, I would like to mix that up too. Like, I think that's been a really helpful part of your story and it's shown like where your mission goes. It's about kind of leveling the playing field yeah, a little bit, absolutely. right? And giving access and opportunity to all creativity regardless of funds. Absolutely, that's, yeah. that's actually beautifully stated. Yeah, I feel like you have that spirit as well and that's, what I, that's, what I, that's why we connect, you know what I mean? Yeah. Awesome. So Laura, Thank you so much for Thank doing you. this. So Honestly, nice. I hope that you know we can continue this conversation privately, but we're gonna be doing more of these types of things. This is gonna go onto a podcast. I want people to know about you. I want them to keep up with what you're doing. Thanks. I want females to come and, and, and join the Female Design Council. Us too. Feel We'd empowered to by them. that. I know you're also doing the thing with that collective, or you did it last year. I don't know if that's gonna continue. Um, we'll keep you posted. Okay, I think it's great. And we're, we're big supporters of you guys, everything you do, so, you know. Thank you it. so much, Thank it means a lot. All right. Awesome. Thanks.